Uh, thank you, John, um, and thank you to Mav for inviting me uh, to come down here. Um, I know shamefully little about the way local government works in this country, but we made that clear from the start. Um, one of the great things about coming down here is that I get to learn loads about what you're doing. And even from listening this morning, I think the thing I've learned is that while our institutional setups are very, very different, um, it may not feel like it, but you're actually a much more decentralised country than we are. We are, um, in England at least, the most centralised country on New Zealand in the OECD. Um, but barring those institutional differences, actually, many of the factors that are affecting our, our local authorities are strikingly similar. So when I saw uh, Rowena's take on the future, <coughs> you could have given that presentation in London and everyone would have recognised those factors. Um, so because I don't know enough about um, the way you do things here, I'm not going to attempt to talk to you in context. I'm going to give you a whistle-stop tour through some of the things that are happening in, uh, in England. And I need to be very careful to say England, because Scotland and Wales is different. Um, I'm going to give you a tour through that, um, and let's see uh, where the commonalities are. Um, I will try and be as clear as I can um, about what's happening. If there's stuff that doesn't make sense, or if I'm assuming knowledge that you don't have, Please feel free to interrupt and I'll explain. So, quick word about LGN. Um, we're a think tank, which means we're basically an independent research institute. We've been around since about 1996, um, with a general mission to try and modernise local government. Um, what's different about us from a lot of other think tanks is we're not just a research institute, we're also a network, we're not a representative body, but we work closely with a number of local authorities in the United Kingdom, about 30 of them, which is around 10% of the total. And that keeps us really grounded in the practicalities of local governments. Um, the people that we write for are people like you, um, intelligent, want to be challenged, but equally want to know what you do with the work right now. So we try and do stuff that's a little bit out there, but is also really practical. And as you'll see from here, we also work with a lot of people in the corporate sector. So we work at the interface between public and private. We try and bring private sector ideas in as well. So, the future of local government in the UK, that pretty much sums it up. Um, You'll all have heard about the, uh, the, the genuinely vast and um, awe-inspiring size of our budget deficit, which we're not really dealing with at the moment. Um, in order to get that budget deficit down, and instead we haven't got it down, it's still rising, um, we are cutting public services very dramatically. Um, this is what it looks like for local governments at the moment. Um, at the moment, UK local government is taking about a 20% cut in its central government grants um, of the current spending round, which comes to an end this year. Um, in fact, it comes to an end next year. Um, what you can see here is that local government is taking um, a walloping. Uh, what this shows you is index funding changes for a range of public services. You can see here the health service actually has its funding increasing. Uh, the government has decided it's going to protect health service budgets, so those, um, there will be no real terms cut. Education more or less protected, again, not really a real terms cut there. Um, overall, UK government spending pretty flat, and then that big red line is local government. Uh, local government is probably the fourth biggest budget line for, for the UK. So it's taking a walloping, um, and that's not going to change. Um, the current government, which is a coalition between the Conservatives and the Liberal Democrats, is going to keep on cutting. If they win the next election, they probably will have to do exactly the same, because everyone's going to protect those big box services, health and education, and if you protect those, you've got to keep on cutting local government. So it's bad times for our local authorities. Um, to give you a sense, um, talking to the chief executive of one big council recently, Warwickshire, which is something over West Midlands, he reckons he's taken about 20% of his baseline budget from 2010 out so far. He thinks there's probably about another 30% to come by 2018. Um, you take all that into account, you're looking at something like 40-45% uh, of Warwickshire's budget going over eight years. That's quite something. Unsurprisingly, our local authorities are feeling the strain. Um, this is a chart that our uh, uh, the Audit Commission, which is a kind of one of our supreme audit bodies, uh, produced. They audit local government's accounts. <coughs> they tried to work out how many councils were feeding the strain of this financial consolidation. They reckon something like 10% of our councils are facing very serious short-term financial strain. And by that, they mean that those councils may not actually be viable as standalone organisations in future. Uh, they may not be able to meet their statutory requirements. Um, We've already got one council, a Somerset, which is tiny, which has come out and said that basically, in three or four years' time, it won't be able to keep going. We don't know what you do in the UK about a council that fails, because it's never happened before. So we're going to have to work that out. But it's not just West Somerset. Uh, there are quite a few councils who basically are going to have to do something pretty dramatic 
if they want to still be here by the end of the decade. Um, even scarier than that, if you look at that future risk group, um, the next bunch of bars, that's about another 20 or 30 percent of local government. So you're looking at something like, you know, I noticed that figure earlier from PwC, 40 percent of Australian local authorities might not be viable. Well, actually, that's not so far off where we are. Um, so it's pretty dramatic what's happening. Before I go into some of the implications of that in terms of services, um, I thought it was just worth putting this chart up quickly. This gives you a very brief overview of what an English council spends its money on. Um, so you can see here the big spending, it's uh, adult social care. Uh, this is based on Swindon, which is a town in the southwest. Um, so they spend about 30% of their budget on care for adults. That's mostly elderly care. Um, not all of it, it's also for adults with learning disabilities. Um, education. Um, one of the weird things there is that our local authorities don't really do education anymore, but they provide a load of support services, and that costs a lot of money. Children's social care, so things like looking after our vulnerable kids, safeguarding children, taking them into care. And then things like environmental services, so that's your bins, your roads, that's only 10% of the budget though. So it gives you a sense of where we spend our money. I don't know how that maps on to, to whether you guys spend yours. Um, but obviously the big thing here is that social care makes up a gigantic proportion of the UK local authorities' budget. And that's a problem, because we have an aging population. So demand for social care is going up dramatically. These are projections from the Local Government Association in the UK about what happens out towards the end of the decade. And this is the point I was making about social care. So that, that dark blue bar at the bottom, that's social care for kids. The light blue one is social care for adults. And the, uh, the mauve one is environmental services. Demand for those keeps on pushing the costs up. And that means that the money available for all other services gets really, really squeezed. So you look there, um, we're talking about what, something like £21 billion pounds currently spent on other services. That's going to go down to what looks to me like something like 5 or £6 billion by the end of the decade. Everything that's not those services gets squeezed. What does that mean? Well, we, we did a wargaming exercise. We simulated um, setting a budget to 2018 for a fictional council called Edinburgh. So we created any borough, it's based on a town in the southwest of England. Um, we used their financial data and we asked a bunch of chief executives to, to kind of play a game where they set the budget for that council. How would they survive? What they basically did was get out of a load of services. They made a lot of people redundant. Uh, there were already hundreds of thousands of people in local government being made redundant, but it's going to be a lot more. Um, they got out of areas like leisure, tourism, culture, libraries. They basically turned those into a social enterprise and then cut all this funding. Um, so by the end of this, this process, if you live in any borough, the only way you're getting a discount on those kinds of services is if you're very, very poor and you've probably got a smart card then, which will give you a discount. Otherwise, you're paying a going rate, you're paying a commercial rate, there's no subsidy. Um, they also got out of education support services. Um, they basically said, right, we're not going to do that anymore, schools can pay for their own services. Um, and a big thing, this is a really big debate in the UK at the moment, they, uh, they decided to try and integrate health and social care. At the moment we have a really big issue because our health services run in one place, our social services are run in another. Uh, that means that lots of people um, are in hospital beds who don't really need to be. Um, they might be ready to move into some form of domiciliary care, um, but there aren't enough places, like it's stuck in hospital. That's really expensive. It costs about twice as much to keep someone in a hospital bed as it does to keep them in a care home. Um, similarly, there's all sorts of preventative work local authorities can do to stop people falling over, to stop a need in hospital care in the first place. The fact that those things aren't integrated costs us a huge amount of money. So if you integrate those things, in theory, you can save billions of pounds. So in this game, they did that. They still had to cut loads of stuff. So emerging trends we're starting to see for the future in the UK. Um, so a couple of things which I think are important. One is this idea of, of going from, and I should say, when I, when I put these trends forward, um, it's not that stark, right? I mean, you look here, I've got from social provision to leading growth. Social provision is hugely important, it's the core of what councils do, I'm not suggesting they're going to leave that behind. This is really about shifts of emphasis. So the first one is from retrenching to redeveloping. Um, and what I mean by that briefly, I'll go into these in more detail, but what I mean by that briefly is we've gone through a period where local governments just had to make cuts to get money out the door. Now I think we're entering a period where local government is thinking about its future roles. So it's not just about we're going to be smaller in the future, they're now saying, right, what roles do we grow into? What are the new things that we have to start doing? Uh, from wholesale provider to retail advisor, there was a time not too long ago where local government directly delivered lots of the services in its local area, um, had lots of formal control over a load of services. That's increasingly not the case. Increasingly, local government's job is to ensure there's a market for services out there and to advise local people how to get the right package for themselves. 
from social provision to leading growth. Um, for the last 50 or 60 years, we've assumed that the main role of local government is to provide a load of social services to people. Uh, so, you know, to provide them with social care, to provide them with housing. Um, increasingly, we see the role of local government as being to drive economic growth. And there's a whole load of reform that's happening in the UK at the moment to shift to growth. Um, from competition to collaborative governance, what I mean by that is that in the UK we do not have a very strong tradition of councils working together. If anything, the politics is much more better for neighbour. That's having to change. Councils are having to work together much more effectively. Uh, it's a slow process, but it's very much starting, and I'll give you some examples of that. And then finally, from elected service providers to network politics, um, one of the big problems I think we've had in the UK is that because we're so obsessed um, with the quality of our public services, we've turned our politicians effectively into elected managers. We want our politicians to deliver better KPIs. Um, now, actually, that's not good enough, because it means that our politics is bloodless, it's dull, people don't engage with it. Um, we're entering a very different era, I think, for the way we do politics locally in the UK. Or, put it slightly differently, I think, we're, I think we have already entered a different era for politics, and our politicians have not yet caught up with it. And if they don't, our local politics will continue to, to die, and it is dying. So some detail. From retrenching to redeveloping, this is from a survey that was done um, last year. This is really kind of showing you how councils have retrenched in the UK. Uh, they asked a bunch of local authorities, this is from PWC as well, hard to avoid. Um, they asked councils how they were coping with the cuts. And this is your retrenching behaviour. So uh, number one up there, they reviewed and improved their existing procurement contracts. What does that really mean? It means they screwed down cost. They went back to their suppliers and they said, right, we want the same thing, but we want it 15% cheaper. And by and large, their suppliers went with that. Um, so they basically really screwed down costs on their contracts. Management restructuring, I mean, that's code basically for sacking managers. Uh, if you're in a big county council at the moment, you've probably got three executive directors at the top tier. So you'll have a chief executive, you'll have someone who does place-based services, which are things like environmental services, roads, rubbish, <coughs> things. And you'll have someone who does people services, which is basically social care. And that will be your senior management team, because everyone else is gone. Um, so management restructuring, that's getting rid of people. Improving service delivery processes, again, that's code for cutting cost out. Um, restructuring and closing central services. Um, one of the things you've seen is a real gutting of some service areas. Um, you look at planning, um, something like 50 or 60% of the planning budget has gone in, in UK local governments. And that's very short-sighted, actually, um, because planning is really important to the economic growth agenda. Um, but nonetheless, you've seen planning departments gutted. In lots of areas, they've cut highways budgets. Anything the public doesn't notice um, has been cut. The problem, of course, is it's stuff the public doesn't notice in the short term. The public is going to notice. The bad people government are always planners. They're going to notice the potholes. <coughs> they won't notice for a few years yet. Um, and then you've got lots of things like asset disposals. Councils in the UK, I'm sure you're the same, own loads of land and property. And quite a bit of it's been sitting around being useless for a long time. So lots of councils have been selling that off. So you can see what I mean. This is really defensive stuff. It's really short term. It's the stuff you have to do to save that money. Um, it's hard, but it's not clever. And I think we're moving to a, a point now where actually you can't get away with that anymore. Um, a lot of people talk about the idea of better for less in the UK. We've got to uh, we've got to provide better services with less money. Um, actually, I think we're moving beyond that now. You can't just efficiency your way out of all of this. So increasingly, I start I started telling people it's not about better for less. It's about less but better. That's the era I think we're moving into. So what are some of those new roles councils starting to grasp? Um, well, John touched on this this morning, this idea that councils aren't so much about direct delivery anymore. Um, this diagram would have been a lot simpler 15 or 20 years ago because the council would have had much more control over these services. This is a, a very rough attempt uh, I, I made to try and map what a local area's public services look like now. So you've got the council at the top, but actually the council's really advising, building community capacity, providing budgets, commissioning communal services, but it's not doing is delivering lots of these things. So the police force, which the council used to have some grip on, is now run by a directly elected police commissioner. Um, councils have very little grip on the school system now. They provide low support services. They have to ensure there are school places there. But actually, they're not, they're not really doing anything to deliver mainstream school services. Um, those are run by semi-independent academies. Increasingly, they're also being run by a new class of school we've got called free schools. Um, any, any local group of families can set up a free school if they want to. Um, so you've got all these independent players in the education system. Um, you've got personalised budgets for social care, so increasingly if you're receiving um, care from the state, if, it's, uh, if you're an older person, if you need a care home place, if you need support to live in your own home, that money's coming directly to you and you're able to go and buy that service. 
Um, and what a lot of councils are doing is setting up eBay style exchanges. So actually, you can just go straight to the marketplace and buy that service from people out there. Um, and then you've got a whole load of new roles for citizens. Um, so you know, the new government has introduced a whole load of new rights for citizens. Um, they've now got rights to uh, strike planning in their area. They can set up their own neighbourhood plan. Um, they can bid to take over the running of services. Um, they can go to the council and say, right, we want to take on Meals on Wheels in this area, we want to run that library, and the council has to give them a shot at bidding to run the service. Um, so you're seeing communities being given much more active roles to play. Um, this is part of what we used to call the big society agenda, uh, where the public were going to come in and take on lots of things the government used to do. It didn't quite work like that. No one talks about the big society anymore. Um, but nonetheless, quietly, you are seeing things like time banking, social enterprises, communities are taking on a bit more. Um, so a good example, um, lots of councils are trying to cut library provision at the moment. Hugely controversial. Um, the public loves its libraries, they don't use them. Um, <laughs> library visits are actually falling. Some of our libraries are absurdly expensive. Um, there are libraries, um, not just in London, there are libraries in London where it would actually be cheaper for the council to buy someone two new copies of the book than to issue it to a library. Um, they're rare, but they exist. Um, but nonetheless, the public hates it when you try and close the library. So there is a movement now to try and get the community to, um, to take on more of those uh, sorts of duties. And actually, the number of people volunteering in libraries has reached record levels. So you are starting to see the public playing a bigger role. So what does that model look like? This is, I'm obsessed with Swindon. Sorry, I keep on going on about Swindon today. Um, but Swindon have a very clear model about how they're moving towards becoming this kind of commissioning organisation. So we don't do that direct delivery. We're there to make sure people get what they need, not to deliver it to them. So this is their model. You've got this idea that the council um, becomes a sort of strategy and commissioning body. It's on the vision for the place, it's setting the strategy, it's defining what the outcomes are, um, and it's developing the, mar the market and the frameworks for delivery. It's basically making sure there's a market out there. The real action is in the locality, so neighbourhoods, wards, the council's working alongside neighbourhoods and wards to define what they need, what are the services they need, what are the outcomes they want. Um, and then it works with that locality to make sure those services are there. And it's getting those services from a really diverse bunch of delivery bodies. Uh, the community, the voluntary sector, the private and public sector. This isn't about getting out of direct delivery entirely. Most councils will still provide quite a few services directly. But it is about a very big market. <coughs> and it's about lots of different players. And it's about saying to each locality, what's the right package of services to you? And this kind of model, this is just, you know, Swindon has their own way of expressing it, but this is really common. Lots of councils are moving down this sort of route. They think it's going to save them money. Um, it's not clear if it will. Um, but they certainly think actually it's going to provide better services. Um, and that, that's probably true. It probably will. So what else? Um, from social provision to leading growth. Um, as I said earlier, we've gotten used to the idea that councils are, are effectively there to provide a bunch of services to the local community. Well, actually, because we've had a prolonged depression in the UK, we're increasingly thinking that the role of councils is to drive economic growth. Uh, and actually, one of the things that's happening that's been really interesting is that the, the funding base for local government has started to shift, not massively, but slightly in the direction of being related to the performance of the local economy. So in the past, we funded councils principally on need, increasing there's a bigger element of funding them on their ability to drive growth. Um, why am I showing you a big picture of Telford? Um, the UK um, tourist authorities will not thank me for showing you this. Telford is an awful, awful, terrible place. Do not go there. Um, Telford, is a, Telford is a new town, I went there on Friday, it, it's wonderful, and I'll tell you why in a minute, but Telford essentially was, uh, we set up a load of new towns in the 50s and 60s to try and get people to move out of London. Telford was a bunch of villages, and they just stuck a massive car park and a supermarket in the middle of them and said, right, now you're a town, get going. And it's, it's, it's terrible. Um, but the good thing about being such a mess is that it's given them a huge potential uh, to redevelop the town. So they basically knocked down their entire town centre and they're starting again. They're building a nighttime economy. At the moment, everything in Telford shuts at five. So you know, if you fancy a night out in Telford, you know, don't. You can't have one. It's impossible. Um, so they're redeveloping the whole town centre. Um, and what that means is essentially they're trading their way out of austerity. So how are they doing that? They're doing it partly because of, there are incentives for growth in the UK. So if you build new houses, you get more council tax for them. So there's the new house bonus. Um, you get uh, a bonus on your business rate income. So you get to retain a bit more of the growth in that. But actually the really clever thing Telford did is that rather than letting the private sector get on and build all this and make all the money off it, they funded all the development themselves. They're going to own those houses, and they're going to own the property that lots of those new businesses are in, and they'll get the money from it. They'll get rent, um, and they'll get capital growth, which is awesome. So if you're Telford, you're facing probably a £40 million cut in your budget over the next four or five years, but you'll bring in about £15 million more in your development. 
So actually, you're growing your way out of the problem that you face to some extent. And increasingly, um, another concrete monstrosity, sorry, this is a big shopping centre in Birmingham, which the city council owns, and I'll explain why that's important in a second. Um, but increasingly, councils in the UK are starting to see themselves more as businesses, as investment funds, um, which I think is a very good development. In the past, uh, UK local authorities have really seen their role in infrastructure as being to fund stuff that's socially useful for their areas. Increasingly, they're thinking, actually, our role is to, is to do that, but it's also to make a return on it. It's to make some money off it. It's not about speculating in the way the private sector would, but it's about saying, well, if we spend all this money, shouldn't we be getting 3 or 4% off that? which we can then use to reinvest in other stuff we want to do locally. So some examples of how that's worked, um, Oxford Castle, um, a derelict site, Oxford City Council got the consultants in and they said, just leave this thing to crumble, it's worth nothing. Uh, they didn't accept that at the council, um, so they rented it out to film crews to generate a bit of money. Um, they used that money to unlock a ton of private investment. That site, which was just falling apart, is now a shopping complex, it's a posh hotel, it now generates um, something like a million pounds a year for the council in terms of rent. Um, the New Street redevelopment, redevelopment in Birmingham, that's another example. Birmingham is, is probably the second biggest city in the UK, um, but it's a mess. I mean, in urban planning terms, it's horrible. Um, and the, the, the railway station is the main way you come into Birmingham, and it's surrounded by a ring road. It's, it's, it's all, they're redeveloping the whole thing, and the way they're funding that is the city council bought the shopping centre um, next to um, the railway station. They're using the income from that shopping centre to unlock lots of land around it. That's how they're doing the redevelopment. So it's a council that owns and is currently renovating the shopping centre. Um, and energy generation. That's becoming a big topic in the UK at the moment. Um, so Woking, tiny little district council, no budget. Over the last 15 years, they've created their own energy generation infrastructure, which is making lots of money for them. In some ways, this is a return to time for UK local government. Um, in the 19th century, even the early 20th century, UK local government grew off the back of what we called gas and water socialism. Um, they, they built uh, local gas works, local water plants, they made money off it. That's where, that's where the basis of our local welfare state came from. Um, in fact, there's a, a place uh, in Shoreditch just down the road from where we work in London, um, which is a tiny parish council, no budget at all. But they, had, uh, they used local crematoriums as a source of heat, which they used to heat local public baths. <laughs> And uh, public baths back then were a big deal because actually, you know, if you were if you were a working class person in Shoreditch, you didn't have a bath in your house, you didn't have running water. So a hot public bath, that was a massive public health focus. So we're seeing this real kind of entrepreneurial spirit coming in, and I guess it's a really important point here that while UK local government, English local government, is taking absolute hammering in budget terms, so while that is grim and unpleasant, and I wouldn't wish it on anyone, it has unlocked uh, an entrepreneurial spirit uh, which was suffocated for a long time. And I think that comes from the fact that a lot of people in local government are saying, yes, this is really hard, but how often do you get to really reshape a whole tier of government? This comes along once in a generation, so we have to make the most of it. So from competition to collaborative governance, as I said earlier, we've got a, a, a very strong tradition of local government, everyone cordially hating their neighbours and not working together. Um, that is changing, and I've got three examples here of how that's changing. So if you look at Greater Manchester, um, one of the problems we have is that our local authorities don't cover the places that their name suggests they do. Manchester City Council literally covers the CBD in Manchester. But actually the Manchester economy is a whole city that's covered by 10 councils. So if you want to do economic growth in Manchester, you need those 10 councils around the table. So they've set up this slightly weird thing called a combined authority. These are taking off massively at the moment in the UK. It's essentially a new tier of government. It's a new city-wide tier of government. It's got a statutory basis. Um, it formally runs the transport fund for the area, but really it's a coordination point. All the councils are on it, they take decisions together about a particular infrastructure investment in their area. So the big thing in Manchester is their new tram system. Manchester's whole take on the world is based on agglomeration economics. South Manchester is growing like Topsy. The rest of Manchester is in trouble, so you connect the outlying bits of Manchester to South Manchester and everyone can go there to get jobs. So they built this very big, very expensive tram network, which is designed to support that. They couldn't have done that as individual councils because they can argued over who got the tram network, who was paying. With this cool governance, they can do that much more effectively. And I, I reckon by 2015, 2016, more or less every big city in the UK is going to have one of these things. Um, Suffolk County Council, that's another really interesting example. That's a two tier area. So you have a county council and a load of smaller districts. Suffolk has seven district councils with four chief executives. Because most of the district councils have shared chief executives, they've got one chief for every two councils, and they're starting to integrate their workforces as well. So 
So actually, some of these councils effectively have one workforce behind two lots of councillors. Um, they're saving quite a lot of money, and it's working really well, actually, for some of them. To the extent I did, I did a survey in Suffolk recently, and the, the officers there couldn't tell me which council they worked for. It was a real problem for my survey method. Uh, they actually, one council boycotted the survey entirely because they just said I didn't understand what was happening there. Um, so there's a lot of this happening. Those small districts are starting effectively to integrate their workforces entirely. So you have two different sovereign bodies with one delivery workforce behind them. And that's not just small councils. So coming down to London, there's an experiment in London called uh, Triborough. It's three inner London boroughs. They're all conservative controlled. It does seem to help if you have councils with the same political complexion for this. Um, and that's three London boroughs combining together, sharing their workforces. They reckon they're going to save about £33 million by doing that, which is quite a lot of money. Um, so we are seeing this shift towards collaborative governance, um, towards sharing of services. Um, you're talking about shared services later. I mean, from our experience in, in England, a slight word of caution, um, it hasn't taken off in the way we expected it to in England. And that's principally because actually it doesn't save you that much money unless you're very radical about it. So while these councils are effectively merging, saves quite a lot of money, if all you're doing is saving your back office, actually in England we found that isn't tons of cash. And the reason is because if, if you look at best-in-class savings uh, for the private sector for shared services, it's about 40%. In local government, the best I've seen is 20%, and to be honest, I'm skeptical about that. Now you look at a big local authority in England, their whole back office probably costs them less than 3% of their overall budget. So if you're doing shared services, You've got a whole lot of work to do. You've got to convince your workforce, your politicians. Um, you've got to go through a whole lot of technical changes, a two-year procurement process for less than a one percent saving on your overall budget. That's why it hasn't taken off. Um, and semi-final point um, from elected managers to network politics. I think this is really important. Um, if you look at all the surveys of our politicians in the UK, they're what you might call sort of soft bullies. Um, they believe they're elected to decide things. And they are, but actually it's more complicated now. Um, because yes, you're elected to decide things, but actually, in a networked world, you're deciding those with loads of other people watching you very closely who want to be in on that decision making process. Um, if any of you are on Twitter, I know some of you are because they've been exchanging tweets with you, you can't take your decisions in the way you would have done 20 or 30 years ago because you'll have citizens hammering on your door using electronic media to tell you what they think. I think the networked world demands of politicians that you're much more open and transparent about the way that you're making your decisions, that you're letting people into the decision making process. Anyone who's familiar um, with the Pirate Party in Europe, one of them taking a, a really radical um, approach to network democracy. As a party, lots of them actually take decisions using an online platform called Liquid Democracy. Their members vote on their policy positions. What's different about Liquid Democracy, why it's not just an e-voting system, is that if you don't really care about an issue, you can give your vote to someone who you think is an expert, and they can vote for you. Um, and the Pirates are actually starting to win seats. They've got seats in Iceland, they've got seats in the Berlin Parliament, um, I don't know if liquid democracy is the way forward, but I think that approach uh, absolutely is part of the way forward. And if any of you follow Cory Booker, the mayor of Newark in the States, he, he's awesome on Twitter. He has direct dialogue with loads of his citizens all the time. If they complain about something, he'll give them a phone number to call, and he'll respond directly. Um, the quote that Rowena, that Rowena used earlier um, about the chief task of contemporary politics being to share information comes from the guy in the Superman outfit on here. He's Antonis Mokas, who is the mayor of Bogota. I think he is um, a superb example of the new politics. Mokas came to power in Bogota. It's a city where gangsters used to fire bazookas at each other from helicopters. It's lawless. Um, really high homicide rates, massive um, road traffic deaths. Mokas decided to change that. Um, and bear in mind that Bogota City Council doesn't have a lot of money. So he had to go and do this, basically using the power of his personal leadership. He's an extraordinary guy. He dressed up in a Superman outfit, and he walked around the streets telling people off about behaviour. Um, this is a city where you can get shot for doing that. Mokas walked around in a Superman outfit. Um, he declared, this is another picture on here, he declared that one night in Bogota City Centre would be ladies' night, and all the men should stay at home and look after the kids. And it sort of worked. <laughs> um, he asked everyone to pay a voluntary tax to fund improvements in the city, and he did it. Um, he would do things like appear on television, having a shower, showing people how to shower um, so they save water, and they save water. He, he did these wonderful, wonderful stunts. Um, the the mime artist at the top, he hired mime artists to mock about drivers at intersections. And it's, it's, perhaps the most beautiful stunt he did was whenever someone died, this is tragic, but it, it's also beautiful, he, um, he would get the city, um, the city environmental services guys to go out and paint a white figure on the road where people had died. 
Now, that sounds symbolic, but actually, if you're a driver and you see that, it's pretty obvious that's a dangerous intersection you need to take care of. So I think, actually, in a world of less money, where we're leading through networks, I think Mokas is the network leader par excellence, because what he did was not say, I'm going to decide and I'm going to do things. He said, I'm going to lead. I'm going to show you how we can change. I want you to come with me. And he did it brilliantly. So I, I think um, I think you, you know, we could do with more mockuses in the world. To give my favourite mockus example. So here's how you guys, as politicians, as personal leaders, can follow the mockus way. He first wrote to National Province because he was a professor at Bogotá University. And he had a bunch of striking students on national television. He couldn't make himself heard. So he turned around, dropped his trousers and mooned them. Um, and they shut up. And he made his point. So yeah. Uh, this is my message to you, moon your electorates. Um, <laughs> um, I'm not going to bore that now, because you really don't want to see my behind. Um, so, some big questions I think from the UK. Um, some, big, some big questions, some big problems we've got. Um, sovereignty is the hard thing. Councils protect their sovereignty very, very jealously. But I think if we're going to survive, we need to find new ways to share that sovereignty. Current trends suggest we're going to have to share it and it's going to have to go upwards to the level of cities and downwards to the level of neighbourhoods and to individuals and communities. We're going to have to dilute sovereignty, and that's really hard. But actually, it requires politicians to accept that sharing power is not a zero-sum game. By giving it away, you don't have less of it. If you use it well, you have more. And I think we have to get that. Um, so can the councils overcome their historic rivalries and collaborate? If they don't, it's the point John made this morning, someone's going to force them to change. So we have to find ways to do that. Can politicians change the way they work, or are we doomed to forever lower levels of legitimacy? I'm actually a big fan of compulsory voting. Um, I'm really interested in the fact that you guys do that here. In the UK, typical turnout for a council election is around 30%. Has been for a very long time. It's not good enough, and we don't care enough about it. We need to do something about it. And at the same time, can we innovate fast enough to contain costs? We've got to find ways to do our services a lot better and a lot cheaper, because if we don't, our capacity to govern our places will be sucked away from us. There are really only two scenarios for the future of local government in, in my country. And one is residualisation, where the cuts just force you to put all your money into social care and stop you doing anything else. Or it's finding ways to break out of that by innovating quite radically. We haven't done enough of that yet. We have to up the pace. So really, the big question is, are councils heading towards residualisation or rebirth? I'm hopeful about our future because of this guy. This is uh, Alfred Salter. He was GP in Bermondsey, which is a, it was a tiny postage stamp in a London borough, one of the poorest, most deprived parts of our capital. Um, he was a GP, and he looked around him, and he saw the awful, awful health conditions of his fellow citizens. And he said, right, we're going to do something about this. So in the 1920s, um, before we had anything like our current welfare state, Salter built a prototype NHS in Bermondsey from nothing. He charged people more on their rates. He built uh, tuberculosis facilities, which were the envy of the country. Um, to the extent that when we introduced the NHS, his facilities were too good, were too expensive to maintain. When the NHS came along, he had to shut down his services. If he could do that in the 1920s, with no money, off the back of his political legitimacy, off the back of the debate with the public, what can we do now? Thank you.